Good evening, everyone. I am so glad to have the opportunity to welcome you to tonight's Alumni Achievement Award. My name is Meredith Turnell, Rachel Carson College, class of 2009, and the president of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council. In 1984, the UCSC Alumni Office began honoring alumni who have made outstanding contributions to their field. Recipients are alumni of UC Santa Cruz who have rendered special and outstanding service to UCSC or who, by personal achievement, have brought distinction to the university. This evening, we will be honoring the 36th Alumni Achievement recipient for UC Santa Cruz. And now I'd like to welcome our Chancellor, Cindy LaReeve. Cindy has long demonstrated a deep commitment to student success, inclusion, and equity. She is an accomplished bioanalytical chemist who came to UC Santa Cruz from our sister campus, UC Riverside. And prior to Riverside, she was a chemistry professor at the University of Kansas. Like so many of our UC Santa Cruz students, Chancellor LaReeve is a first-generation college graduate. And with that, I'd like to welcome Chancellor LaReeve. Thank you, Meredith, and welcome everyone. I am so honored to be taking part in today's event, celebrating achievement of our students, our staff, our faculty, and of course, our alumni is one of the very best aspects of my job. Some of you may have seen earlier this year that UC Santa Cruz was recognized as the number three public university in the nation for students focused on making an impact. Underscoring our reputation as home to people pushing for positive change. This recognition by Princeton Review was a great honor and it speaks to the students we attract. But it's important that we do not overlook that attracting students with this focus is not something new for us. We are an institution focused on social justice and equity that has long fostered a culture University made up of remarkable people and, and that people who are dedicated to make the world a better place is a good case in point of tonight's honoree, Dr. Barbara Ferrer. I'm buoyed that we've been able to stay the course as a campus, as a county, as a state, and for the most part, a country in fighting this global pandemic. It has been um, not always easy, but it has been that, that public health approach, a focus on science that has allowed our students and faculty and staff to return to our campus and for life to slowly start to return to something close to what it resembled in the days before COVID-19. It feels right that we're honoring someone who has played an outsized role and getting us to this point. And so um, Barbara Ferrer, a 1978 graduate of Rachel Carson College, currently leads the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, which works to protect and promote health and prevent disease in the largest county in the United States with more than 10 million residents. She is nationally known as a public health leader with more than 30 years of professional experience as a th philanthropic strategist, a public health director, educational leader, researcher, and community advocate. Dr. Ferrer served as executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission, where she led a range of public health programs and built innovative partnerships to address inequities in health outcomes and support healthy communities and healthy families. She also served as Director of Health Promotion and Chronic Disease Prevention at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. As principal at a public high school in Boston, she uh, led efforts to um, be able to significantly improve graduation rates and ensure that every graduating senior was accepted to college. Our campus presents this Alumni Achievement Award annually to a UC Santa Cruz graduate has provided outstanding service to campus or who through achievement has brought great distinction to the university. Dr. Ferrer, your work exemplifies the vision, 
and ideals of UC Santa Cruz. It is for these reasons I am delighted to present you the 2021 Alumni Achievement Award. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Ferrer. I am extremely proud to call you a UC Santa Cruz alumna. And now I'll hand the program back over to Meredith. Thank you so much, Chancellor LaReeve. Before we begin, I'm just gonna share a few brief housekeeping details for tonight. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. However, we will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program and invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will also be recorded. So tonight, as the Chancellor shared, we come together to celebrate the extraordinary work of Dr. Barbara Ferrer. To help us, I'm joined by Grant Hartzog, Professor and Chair of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, and Matt Spark, Professor of Politics and the Executive Director of the new Global and Community Health Program here at UCSC. Together with Dr. Ferrer, they will dig in to her path from UC Santa Cruz to the Department of Public Health, the lessons learned over the last two years, leading one of the largest counties in the country through a global pandemic, and the important role of community health in addressing health challenges, both here at home and globally. And so with that, I will hand the program over to our distinguished panel. Hey, thank you so much, Meredith. And um, Dr. Ferrer, it's such an honor to be with you here tonight to celebrate your success and your leadership. Um, in, the, in my program notes, it said, uh, uh, after the chancellor presented you with the award, there'll be an opportunity for you to make some acceptance remarks. So uh, perhaps we should just start with that. And then uh, we've got some questions we'd love to talk through with you uh, following those remarks. Oh yeah, thank you so much. I wanna thank uh, Chancellor Lareve uh, for her leadership and her very kind words. And of course, to the Alumni Council for this tremendous honor. I'm very humbled to be receiving an Alumni Achievement Award from UC Santa Cruz, my esteemed alma mater. I wanna extend my thanks and my deep appreciation to the university leadership, faculty, staff, and alumni for the supportive environment you have provided for many generations of students. As one of the many thousands of individuals fortunate to attend UC Santa Cruz, I benefited enormously from the kindness and wise counsel given by so many of my professors, advisors, and other students. And it was this guidance that helped me, as I'm sure it helped others, when I misstepped, lost hope, or was utterly confused. My award today is in fact a recognition of the strength of this entire university community. My time as a community studies major at UC Santa Cruz changed my life course. And I can say without a doubt that my experiences helped shape my values and created a strong foundation from which I could find purpose and passion. I majored in community studies because of the focus on social justice issues, including racial and economic justice. I learned from others at the university and in the community, the importance of building and sustaining partnerships with those most affected by disproportionality to address the root causes of inequities. UC Santa Cruz created an environment where we were all encouraged to learn with and from each other, making it possible for us to innovate, chart new paths and take bold action, recognizing the power of our collective wisdom. And of course, the past two years have been for all of us, a testament to our interconnectedness and the strength of this continuous learning, partnership and collaboration as we live through a devastating pandemic. As director of a very large public health department, I share this distinct honor with all those who have supported me and with the extraordinary public health workforce and the many community partners who have worked tirelessly to navigate this crisis. I've never accomplished anything by myself, and I'm deeply grateful to all of those who helped me move ahead with courage and kindness. So thank you, Matt, for letting me. Let me thank all of you because I mean it from the bottom of my heart, both humbled and honored, but also, you know, I know I stand here uh, because there were so many people uh, who gave me second, third, fourth, fifth chances 
um, to get my life together. So much appreciated. Oh, thanks. That was wonderful. And, you know, it's one of the challenges of Zoom is that we, you can't hear the applause, but there's applause out there. You know, people are clapping and it it's really uh, wonderful to celebrate this with you. Um, sort of the first question we wanted to pose goes back to those lessons in social justice and racial justice that you, you trace back for yourself to community studies here at UCSC and um, concerns inequalities and COVID. And basically all around the world and all across the United States, COVID has exposed and ex exacerbated inequalities in vulnerability. And LA has been a particularly extreme example of this in the California context. And so we wondered if you could share with us some of the, the lessons uh, from COVID about these inequalities in vulnerability that have been revealed uh, by the pandemic experience and, and what you've seen as the, the director of, of public health for the county. Yeah, it's, it's such a great question. It's so important to really understand what is going on and, and what has going on and why. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit. You know, LA County, over 10 million residents, you know, we're probably larger, I think, than 40 plus states. We're also extraordinarily diverse racially and ethnically. Uh, but really within a few weeks of the pandemic hitting here, you know, this, let's go back March, 2020, uh, it became clear to us that our Latinx and black communities uh, were dis disproportionately impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and consistently uh, case rates, hospitalization rates, and unfortunately and tragically death rates have been two times to three times higher uh, than those of white residents and Asian residents. And I don't think it's unique to LA County. I think patterns like this were seen uh, across uh, the United States. Um, it did expose this pandemic uh, and exacerbated uh, racial inequalities. Uh, essential workers, uh, including those working in healthcare, grocery stores, factories, manufacturing, food service, and infrastructure support, primarily people with uh, low, lower paying jobs, and primarily here in LA County, uh, people of color, they couldn't ever work from home, and they weren't adequ adequately protected at work sites. At first, we didn't know how to protect them, and then when we did, we didn't have the resources, and in some cases, the political will. Uh, people who live in overcrowded housing with poor ventilation, a uh, super at risk, or people who didn't have housing to begin with, 60,000 people here in LA County who don't have housing. These folks can't safely isolate or quarantine, you know, sort of the, the, the tried and true strategy for maintaining and managing a pandemic uh, wasn't possible uh, when they became infected with COVID-19 or they were a close contact to somebody who had been infected. And those without economic resources, they couldn't take time off to stay home when they're sick, to get tested, or even to get vaccinated. Uh, we don't, uh, we weren't able uh, because we don't have broadband broadband coverage mm -hmm. uh, across uh, our county uh, to allow for people uh, who lived in under-resourced, disinvested areas uh, to stay connected to telehealth or distance learning, um, or to take gatherings outside because they often live in communities. Uh, that don't uh, have safe parks or areas uh, close by where people uh, can be outside. Um, so this pandemic exposed, exposed that, uh, exposed these longstanding differences uh, in people's ability to access the very resources you're going to need to be healthy in general, uh, but particularly to maintain, maintain your health and well-being during a pandemic. And I think the pandemic also exposed the erosion of trust. Uh, based on past and present experiences with both the healthcare system and with government. The very organizations that are supposed to help people uh, are experienced and have been uh, by many as unfair, dishonest, and even racist. And this has led to some of our hardest hit communities being fearful of vaccines, of testing, and of government advice. As a result, we've had to work harder to build, strengthen, and expand those very essential uh, networks and relationships with the communities that have been in the hardest hit. Um, and that's taken time. And unfortunately, in that time, people have lost their lives. Um, we do know 
um, that long standing decades of injustices uh, and inequities that existed before the pandemic uh, really reared their head during the pandemic. Nobody could get through this pandemic without seeing firsthand what that injustice looks like. But I think the question in front of us is what are we going to do? Um, because uh, this isn't, you know, sometimes you look at uh, the inequities we see in almost every single health outcome we measure diabetes. We see inequities in cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, inequities in infant mortality, and they play out over a long period of time. But the inequities in the health outcomes associated with COVID played out in months, mm -hmm. uh, right before our very eyes. Uh, and I think what's in front of us now is uh, we can seize an opportunity to address the root causes of these inequities. Uh, or we uh, will live this horror over and over and over again. And we're not done with the pandemic. So uh, if we don't make some, some very quick corrections, uh, we'll continue to see a disproportionality play out for the next months uh, as we try to get to the other side. Right, and, I, I mean, and as an educator, I know you're an, also, uh, an educator uh, before you went into public health, uh, with a lot of experience in Boston, presumably you think um, that education has to play a, a key role uh, in uh, building back better and um, you know really learning these lessons. So Grant has a question on that side of things. So I'll pass the baton over to him. Thanks, Matt. And uh, before I start, I'd just uh, like to join Matt and the Chancellor in congratulating you and uh, thanking you for your work and for joining us today. So uh, as you know, we're developing a new program in global and community health here with both BA and BS degrees. And I'm shamelessly promoting that program with the logo over my shoulder here. Um, so the, the pandemic has made it all the more clear that this is an urgent priority for the university uh, for educating our students and, and for the country at, at large. And based on your own experiences in public health leadership, both before and during the pandemic, what do you think are some of the important elements we should strive to deliver as part of this program that we're building? Yeah, thanks so much, Grant. I mean, first, I'd, I'd want to start and just applaud the university uh, for recognizing the interconnectedness of our world, while also understanding that local policies and practices actually affect how we're organized to ensure that everyone has the resources they're going to need for optimal health and well-being. So, so thank you all for putting in all the work to make this possible uh, for students, but also I think for the broader community we're all in service of. Uh, within the challenges that define our healthcare system today, though, I think there are enormous opportunities to fundamentally shift our focus from disease care models to prevention and building health equity from primarily fixing people to actually thinking about fixing systems. And I'm hoping that that becomes sort of the anchor uh, for the work you're about to undertake. The COVID pandemic has certainly highlighted uh, the need to also establish stable career pathways in public health leadership, data science and information technology, preventing and responding to emergency, emerging threats in, in sort of health and well-being and building those essential partnerships with community organizations and residents. And every single one of these pathways, these careers is anchored uh, or needs to be anchored in what I would call a justice framework and health equity. Uh, we're gonna have to build a very deep bench and we're gonna have to attract many more students and professionals to careers in health and science. Uh, and first of all, uh, we need to make sure that these careers are accessible to underrepresented people of color. Um, who we desperately need uh, to move into leadership roles. Uh, the knowledge that one, uh, I think, uh, has an opportunity to acquire in an undergraduate or graduate education uh, can also be applicable both to where services are delivered. Um, so I'm hoping that you, know, you can embrace sort of our clinics, the training people need to work in clinics, community-based programs, research labs. But I'm also hoping that uh, uh, this will be applicable to people who are uh, working in places where policies get enacted, both at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, um, because work is desperately needed uh, in both places. Um, 
and um, you know, to build a skill set that allows you to recognize that you can't really do um, a good job on the service delivery side if you're not about uh, making changes uh, and addressing challenges through policy and practice um, realignments. Uh, but you also can't really do a great job uh, in the policy arena if you're not connected uh, to the services and resources uh, that are desperately needed uh, by people who live in our communities. So I think you have this great opportunity and looking forward to seeing uh, all the good that you're going to do and your accomplishments. Thanks. And to follow up on this, uh, we're, we're making community studies majors, uh, community studies courses here rather, uh, integral, an in integral part of the new program. And as an alumna of community studies yourself, can you talk about how your UCSC undergraduate education helped to prepare you for the challenges that you faced uh, leading the LA County Public Health Program through this pandemic? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm so proud of, you know, what I, what I, what I was able to, you know, sort of glean from my years at, at UC uh, Santa Cruz. I, I became a, you know, much better person um, because of my education and also the experiences. You know, I want to, I want to note because oftentimes it, it doesn't really stand out. You know, I started as a community organizer, uh, and that passion for working with other people to make change uh, was something I developed at, at UC Santa Cruz. When I arrived, I was actually an education major. Uh, and when I left, I was a community studies major. And I went in uh, to spend the first, you know, I think almost decade uh, as a community organizer, a straight community organizer, working on a whole host of issues uh, that affect all of us. Um, but I learned how to listen. I learned how to be respectful. I learned how to trust that the people most affected by issues and challenges are going to have the best solutions. Um, and that, um, those lessons, um, they've served me better than anything uh, throughout, you know, sort of now I'm an older person. So throughout sort of these long years uh, that I've, you know, been privileged to live. Um, it, it's really uh, at the heart of how I think uh, we each can show up and, and be able to bring our best. Um, we do have to honor everyone else's experiences. Uh, we do have to be respectful and move with grace. Um, and that, that's really uh, what I think community studies is about. I think it is about um, developing a keen sense of how we're gonna build trusting relationships um, and successfully engage with folks uh, by being transparent and honest. Uh, and, you know, I, again, I, I thank everyone for, you know, sort of helping me on that journey because I didn't walk in uh, with, uh, with those skills uh, or with that kind of an understanding. Thank you. I know that's going to be really resonant with all of our community studies colleagues and students and uh, music to their ears to hear that and uh, uh, you know I, I, a lot of us are um, even though we're not in the community studies de department uh, we're, we're connected to it in different ways so uh, many I, I really enjoy going to their poster evenings every year and seeing where the students have done these six month long um, internships and um, the um, it's really impressive what they do and what they can continue to learn by that that deep community involvement. But as I said at the start, I'm a, I'm actually in the politics department myself um, as a professor there, and in that wearing that hat, I'd like to ask you a politics type question about the politics of COVID, um, and in particular what it's been like to be a high profile woman in authority in public health during the pandemic. Um, around the world, especially I think earlier on in the pandemic, many of the leaders who took courageous positions out front uh, in favor of more stringent public health protections were women leaders. And at the same time, we saw much of the anti-masking, anti-vaccine politicking taking the form of angry men uh, arguing for their own personal liberty. And I, I, obviously there were women uh, making libertarian arguments for liberty, liberty as well. But 
Can you share what it's been like to be a high profile, high profile woman leader facing violent threats because of your policy making around public health protections? Yeah, you know, thanks so much, Matt, uh, for that question. I, I guess I want to start by by pointing out, um, as as we talked earlier, um, a very small number of people <clears throat> have made a lot of noise and been very very angry, um, and in their anger, you know, I think behaved, you know, uh, inappropriately, obviously, um, and with a lot of hostility uh, and a lot, frankly, of hatred. Um, but you know. Uh, everyone lost a lot over these last 20 months. Uh, people lost their lives and people lost their livelihoods. Uh, and that sometimes doesn't bring out the best uh, for all of us. Um, and uh, because there's been so much attention paid to the very angry folks, I think we've really neglected to recognize that for people like me, uh, I also enjoyed a lot of support I also saw people uh, be as kind as I've ever seen people be to each other and to perfect strangers, including to me. Um, and, uh, and that outpouring of support, I think, uh, really needs to carry us through those darker moments. Um, and it really needs to color how we see the world. The vast majority of people uh, in LA County uh, are playing by the rules. Um, and they have since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, they've been super cautious uh, about what they do, not just because of personal risks, but because they understand uh, that the actions they're taking affect others. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do hear you that, you know, there are some people who have seen this as uh, an a time to really promote individual liberty and freedom, uh, a sort of sense of entitlement, of being able to make our own rules as individuals. But that is a tiny fraction of the people and that represents a tiny fraction of what's actually happening. Uh, and I'm grateful uh, to every single person who has stood with others, made enormous sacrifices um, to try to get through this pandemic in a way that preserved lives and livelihoods, because I don't think it's one or the other. Uh, I don't think it's possible uh, to live through a pandemic uh, and not play by the rules. <laughs> um, and I don't actually think there are many examples uh, for any of us where we're not asked um, to do things uh, for other people. Uh, we get in our cars and we follow the rules of the road. Uh, we put on our seatbelts. We don't smoke uh, anymore in public places or spaces where that smoke uh, can harm others. Uh, many of us as condition of employment are subject to routine drug testing. We're required if we're in healthcare, certainly to have a set of immunizations. Uh, and all of us uh, are not allowed to inflict violence or hurt other people uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, so we have a, a human pact uh, that we've made with each other, uh, and that's how we go through every single day of our lives. Um, so I think um, the attention that's being paid to a small number of people that have turned this into my freedom uh, uh, is what uh, is most important, I think does not represent what's really uh, going on across this country. Um, and I, I think we should applaud uh, and really lift up uh, the, the graciousness and the grace with which most people have gone through the pandemic. Um, and I say that, you know, because I'm not the only person who's experienced, you know, threats in their life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to sort of give a huge shout out to the courageous leaders of almost every single justice movement that have faced the same sort of, you know, um, threats on their well being, on their families. Uh, you know, our, there's a whole team here now of elected officials also, you know, uh, getting threatened um, as well. And, and I want to say, um, you know, we're going to stay the course, as are most people, uh, to try to make sure we get through this pandemic with as many people uh, being well, uh, not getting sick and not passing away. Um, and we're going to do that with as much integrity as, as we can. 
Uh, we're going to do that by being transparent with information. We're going to do that by reaching out to folks. And we're going to do that by being part of this very caring community uh, that I feel honored and privileged to live in. Oh, those are such heartening remarks. That remind me of um, Arundhati Roy's um, uh, editorial in the, it was published in the Financial Times, which is a strange place for it to appear, but near the beginning of the pandemic, where she talked about COVID being a kind of portal to a better world, and that you can go through a, a pandemic with, with sort of weighed down by all the negativity, as it were, or you can go through lightly and, and seize these opportunities. And, uh, and the way you evoked it, like thinking about freedom coming through the lens of, of our connections, through, through, through living together um, collaboratively and collectively with respect for one another, that's true freedom. And, and that's, a very, that's a great way to sort of open a portal to another world as well, I think. Uh, and uh, it, well, I guess one of the communication challenges though is that how do you communicate that more, more widely in, a, in societies that are so individualistic um, and where people just are, are taught so early on to, to just think of their own freedom as um, you know, basically about their shopping choices kind of thing. Um, it's a really challenging. I think, it's, I think it is really challenging. I mean, I want to I wanna note, though, like we, we have to like share more uh, stories. Um, I, I, I had um, somebody um, at, uh, at one of our school districts send me a video that students at Wilson High School had done. Uh, on their own, you know, wasn't wasn't a sort of public health. Please, students, you know, work with us, or wasn't part of any big effort. Student leaders at that school, the sports team, you know, the the sports players, the student government folks, the the folks that headed up uh, student extracurricular activities. About fifty kids uh, got together and they made this video about getting vaccinated. Now that school has about 90% of their high school students vaccinated, which in LA County is a huge, huge victory. And it was that video uh, that um, really, you know, lent power to the movement uh, for students to understand the importance of getting vaccinated. It was nothing I said or another adult said, it was, a, it was peers talking to their other peers about the importance of getting vaccinated. And I had the privilege, I got invited to go talk to those 50 students who made that video. And every single one of them, every single one of them uh, in sort of going around the room and explaining you know, why they got vaccinated uh, said two things and, and really only one or two things. Um, I did it for my family, I did it for my friends. Um, and, and I think we have to sort of understand how profoundly human it is to take care of somebody else and to put other people's needs at the very top of the list. And that you actually need to get taught not to do that. So I, I don't think we all, I mean, this was a group of students that, you know, they, they were in one of our hardest hit communities in East LA. They had obviously witnessed uh, the destruction of this virus, uh, but they also recognized uh, their obligation uh, to be part of a solution and, uh, and a collective solution. And I think that's actually how most of us uh, can come up and how most of us uh, can, you know, really meet the challenges uh, that are before us. I mean, that's certainly what the UC Santa Cruz experiences was for me, was about sort of the collective coming together, the collective acknowledgement of our profound connections to each other. But I see it everywhere. I just think we don't lift it up. And so what you see is that one person um, shouting uh, that they can't possibly be made to wear a mask um, to, for anybody else. Right. Right. Well, thank you for that beautiful and unexpected response. I have to say, uh, as soon as we're done here, I'm going off to teach a class with uh, another former community studies major. And I'm going to 
completely rip you off. Yeah, <laughs> talk about all of that. It was great. So um, the next question is, uh, you know, the, the experiences of the last two years have really taken our public health systems through an incredible uh, stress test, uh, which we haven't always passed. And how should we go about strengthening our public health systems and better prepare ourselves for future public health challenges? Yeah, I think this is a, a really essential question. So thanks so much. Um, I'd start by saying, you know, it would be easy to just focus on public health infrastructure. Obviously, there's been a lot of systematic defunding uh, of the public health system. Um, you know, it, it's a poor stepchild to, to any of the funding that our healthcare systems get. Um, but I want to actually switch this to the second part of your question first, which is how do we better prepare ourselves for future public health challenges? Um, because I, I want to really highlight that we don't just need investments in public health infrastructure. Uh, we need uh, investments that do two things, two other things. One, address the inequitable distribution of the resources that people need to be healthy and survive the next health challenges. And the other is we need to invest in the infrastructure of community-based organizations who are the drivers, the economic engines in our neighborhoods. Um, and, um, and that's where we're gonna get, the, you know, we're gonna find the ability to address the challenges of climate change. That's where we're gonna find uh, the ability to uh, close those education gaps. That's where, gonna, where we're gonna find the ability to deal with uh, inequities and economic opportunities. Um, and all of that uh, is what really profoundly affects our health status. So if you gave all of the money to really build out a public health infrastructure, we would not have equitable outcomes the next time a pandemic or public health challenges hits us. So I think it's important, but not sufficient to make investments in public health infrastructure. But I think the more important investments are investments in uh, people and communities that have historically and continue today uh, to not have the resources they need to uh, be able to organize uh, to respond to emerging threats and to promote, you know, obviously health and well-being. So can I add a, a follow on question on, on that? Um, because one of the sort of uh, go-betweens uh, but, but that um, sort of mediate between the um, community-based organizations and formal public health agencies uh, and, and the health system are uh, community health workers. And um, in the, um, the book that uh, Grant and I, and along with um, two other colleagues, Nancy Chen and Bill Sullivan, we're, we're using right now in our intro course for the new global and community health uh, majors. Um, it's by Joya Mukherjee and it's on global health delivery, but it reflects all of her experiences with partners in health, working with, with uh, Paul Farmer's um, team and, and building that team herself. And the, the sort of leitmotif as or underlying message of the book is that we need to uh, do a much better job of, of um, mentoring community health workers, building health systems, using community health workers as intermediaries, as trusted community members, but who are also uh, paid and, and trained effectively uh, and, and, and integrated effectively into the health system. And so I'm wondering what you think about the role of community yeah. health workers. Yeah, I mean, super important. It, it's actually, you know, uh, if we're going to talk about some of our successes uh, here uh, in LA County, I'm going to talk about promotoras and I'm going to talk about community health workers. Uh, we actually fund about 40 community-based organizations who have built a vast network of between 300 and 400 promotoras and community health workers that every day uh, are out in our communities. They door knock, they talk to people at their homes, they're in our parks, uh, they're at vaccination sites to answer questions. Uh, and they are, as you said, they, they do have the ability to connect people um, to the resources that they need to be healthy, but to do it in a respectful way uh, that honors, you know, sort of our need to, 
to reflect um, the integrity, the cultural integrity uh, that makes it possible for people to feel comfortable um, coming into other institutions uh, for support and for care. Um, but I think they're more than just intermediaries. I think there are powerful leaders in our community. And so mm -hmm. I, I think we, we should also make sure that as we're um, figuring out uh, training opportunities, and obviously we pay uh, all of our community health workers, I mean, through their community uh, organizations, uh, but we should recognize um, that we, we need their leadership skills as well. <laughs> Uh, and that we have to actually honor uh, the roles that they play already in their communities as leaders um, and allow them to influence how we're designing our own healthcare systems. Like it can't just be uh, their intermediaries. Um, they help bridge the gap between, you know, the public health department and the community. They have to make the public health department better. Like we have to allow them to make the public health department better by listening to them uh, by hearing, you know, sort of the, by, by hearing what they're doing to dispel false narratives um, and then to be able to reflect that and how we get organized. So I think we'd miss an opportunity if we just see them as, you know, sort of bringing, bringing people to us. Like we need to also recognize that they're going to allow public health departments to do, to be better, to do better. Uh, and to be more rooted in the experiences of people in our community. And then we would realign our own services so that they could be more helpful. Because I don't think we're organized necessarily in a way that, um, you know, promotes uh, people's well-being. You know, I think we're, or we're organized to do some things um, that are helpful in that area, but we're also organized to do a lot of things that are not. Like, we often serve as gatekeepers. Yeah. Um, and I think promotoras and community health workers uh, are very clear that they are not going to be gatekeepers to scarce resources. Right, right. Sort of gate creators or gate, gate op door, door, door openers. <laughs> yeah, door openers, yeah. Um, well, that's, that's, uh, it does um, segue, as you were already indicating, to the other question we wanted to ask about successes. So uh, there's been a lot of failure reflected in our how our health system has responded to COVID as as has happened all around the world um, and and yet there have been successes and we wondered if you could talk a little bit more I mean now you've you've mentioned uh, the this in, invaluable work of the community health workers but there are maybe there are other successes you'd like to point to as well yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there's three areas where I'd say, you know, not just LA County, but other places have have really fundamentally changed how we do our work during a pandemic. So the first thing I want to talk about is protecting essential workers. So way back in April, we recognized that while we were not going to be able to um, change work conditions. Uh, to the extent that they need to be changed. Uh, we don't have that power, we don't set wages, you know, we can't do, we can't do that fundamental economic equity work. But with health officer orders, we could mandate that workplaces become safe for workers. And we use those health officer orders uh, to in fact create much more safety at work sites. And then we close down workplaces that weren't following the health officer orders. So we had a lot of mandates around this, particularly the first year. Uh, pre-vaccinations uh, around what we needed to see to protect workers. Um, and, uh, and it included access to testing. Uh, it included um, access to uh, safety uh, at, work, at work sites, uh, spacing, <coughs> uh, impermeable barriers, um, protections for workers around masking and requirements for others around them to mask. I mean, we really took a hard look at what we could do with health officer orders and then focus uh, a whole bunch on the ability to change working conditions in the middle of the pandemic. And I don't think we were the only ones that recognized, you know, it would take far too long to even get, I mean, sometimes it takes four months to get Cal OSHA to come to a work site, but we deployed our environmental health inspectors to work sites, hundreds and hundreds of work sites uh, every single day. Mm. Um, and uh, we had an anonymous complaint line 
Um, so people didn't need to fear losing their jobs if they reported to us. We created worker public health councils and we have uh, dedicated partnerships with our, with our unions. Um, so, uh, you know, again, like uh, these are the folks who were the most hurt uh, by this pandemic. Um, and while we couldn't fix everything uh, that absolutely needs to be fixed, um, I think we use this as a moment to actually uh, make sure that uh, we were doing everything we could around worker protections. Uh, and I think it, it helped, you know, um, and, you know, yes, um, there have been, you know, a fair number of complaints and lawsuits filed against us. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, workers here in LA County know that we care deeply about them and that we're going to do everything we can uh, to keep them as safe as possible. So, We've issued a lot of citations. Uh, we do tons of out, uh, investigations and we have a rule that every time there's three or more cases at any work site, it has to be reported to us and we take over with an outbreak investigation. So again, these are short-term uh, fixes, uh, but I think they get to the heart of what's important, which is we gotta build partnerships uh, with the workers uh, we have to support the workers that are not unionized uh, with public health councils, worker councils, um, so that they can come together and be part of the effort uh, to create worker safety. I think that was one area. I think we also did a lot of work at our schools. Um, so we've really not had any schools, uh, you know, be, be, once schools could reopen and, you know, again, in California, that was a complex algorithm, but starting uh, last fall and then into this new year, schools were able to reopen for a whole host of services and then fully reopen uh, in the early spring. Um, and we again uh, reassigned a whole bunch of our staff uh, to support schools. Uh, and in supporting schools, we created also um, two programs, uh, a parent ambassador program and a student ambassador program. Because we think peer to peer uh, education and support is essential. Um, and, uh, and we also think that this is a way to empower parents and students uh, to be part of the solutions at schools. Obviously, we're very focused on COVID and COVID practices, safety practices, but this is, uh, can evolve into parents and students being part of decision-making structures at school as well, uh, feeling more welcomed, being more part of their school communities, and again, we've had enormous positive reception uh, from school administrators, uh, the teachers unions and the employee unions and parents and students. Because um, I think the COVID allowed us to recognize how intimately connected everything is at a school. Um, and, and safety for the school means that there's safety at home and in the community as well, or else you know, those cases just come into the school building. Um, so getting everyone to work together, uh, I think, again, really important work that was done. I was so proud. I mean, we have over, well over 100 people that work uh, just with schools, uh, K to 12 schools, um, on, on trying to make sure they have a lot of support uh, around being able to reopen safely, but also to have everyone involved in what that safety looks like. Right. They're really compelling examples, and they, they combine the use of state authority to protect, uh, but with in both cases you've mentioned that, that, that this um, respect for workers' voices, respect for empowering parents, so that the um, people that populate the affected institutions feel like they have a stake uh, in the um, working out of those protections, that they're not just enforced from the top down. So if, if you could, like if you scale up from that um, county level to the to the national level and the, even the global level, I'm wondering what you think about two corollaries of of that at the at the well, at those two scales. So at the national level, right now, the Biden administration is trying to enforce this uh, vaccine mandate uh, using OSHA rules, and uh, it sounds like at least 25, 26 um, states are mainly Republican states are contesting that um, and, and saying it's sort of a, an overreach of OSHA's um, workplace protection kind of um, mandate. And, and yet um, it seems to me that there's, well, uh, first of all, personally, I don't think it's an overreach at all. It is is protective and it's vitally needed. But, but then the, the piece that you mentioned, you know, the, the kind of 
um, articulating how it's um, it, it's in the interests of workers themselves. You know, um, that seems to me to be uh, a critical part. I'm wondering what you think about that. And, and then just the, at the the global level. Perhaps this is stretching it a bit too far, but but um, I feel like a similar argument could be made about um, using uh, the um, sort of exceptions to trips, the so-called Doha Declaration to um, uh, basically do compulsory licensing of the vaccines so that they can be uh, manufactured in Africa and we can get beyond the vaccine apartheid that we're seeing right now, where again, the, the kind of like a top-down um, state enforced form of action over private companies and their profit-making interests is, is undertaken with a view to protecting people. But again, I, it, it needs to, you know, the voices of Africans who are de being currently deprived of vaccines need to be part of that story, it seems to me. No, I, and I think you, I mean, I think you raise the most important issues, which is when uh, we're all going through a pandemic, what interests um, are, are gonna sort of direct the path we take? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that we don't have vaccine everywhere uh, at this point, you know, we're, we're almost a year into vaccine availability in the United States. So the fact that we don't have vaccine available everywhere for everyone isn't, um, it, it didn't just happen by chance. Like there's a whole system that was organized uh, that didn't allow for vaccines to be available for everyone. Um, and uh, there's a whole system that's organized uh, in this country uh, that doesn't really put worker interests front and center uh, at workplaces. So, I mean, we should just be honest about that. Um, because I, I think it in, if we're not honest about what's sort of behind that story, then you're gonna come up with solutions that actually aren't gonna necessarily get us to where we're trying to go. So in the, in the case around global, sort of what's the global work, the global work is that every country needs to be able to have vaccines uh, uh, and, and be able to, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I love the phrasing you use, but I, you know, I like to think about it is, you know, um, there, there should either be a uh, massive redistribution uh, from places that have uh, a lot of capacity or ready to produce. I mean, so like early on, those countries that had a lot of capacity needed to be um, making sure that they were proportioning uh, doses across the world. But in the absence of that, then you're absolutely right. There, there can be no proprietary interests, business interests that make it impossible for countries to be able to produce vaccine uh, quickly and relatively inexpensively uh, for the population. Um, and, and we have neither of those conditions really exist, right? I mean, we're, we're neither redistributing massively nor are we allowing uh, other countries to move forward with haste uh, on being able to, to go ahead and produce. Um, as a matter of fact, in, in this country, we don't, if you come from another country and the World Health Organization hasn't approved the vaccine, so let's talk about Cuba, hasn't mm -hmm. approved the Cuban vaccines, then in this country, you are not vaccinated uh, and you'd have to start over. Um, so, you know, again, I just, I just think, you know, it, it's helpful to sort of understand what that context looks like. And then what, how does it translate uh, into sort of really helping people uh, be protected from this deadly and devastating pandemic? Um, and then I think, you know, uh, putting the interests of workers, I mean, it, it's so interesting um, to see, you know, how um, we've now positioned um, workers to sort of, again, you know, be in opposition to their best interests um, because we've tied it up with job security. I mean, we've just, we've turned this into is an issue that it is not, <laughs> um, you know, and, and you know, I, our relationships with with our labor partners uh, really have indicated overwhelming support for targeted vaccination mandates. Obviously, 
uh, targeted and obviously um, done with a lot of sensitivity um, to the needs for people to have good information. Um, I think it, it's important that people feel like these vaccines are safe and they're effective. Uh, but I also think um, in high risk settings, it's important that people who are working are vaccinated uh, in order to be able to be of service to others who are very vulnerable. So, um, so I, I think we, we're gonna need to live with the mandates. I think it's an appropriate role for government uh, to do targeted mandates. Um, and again, I think uh, business interests um, need to somehow step back uh, when we're in the middle of pandemic, you know, sometimes people just um, will say to me, like, you know, well, we, we just shouldn't do these things. And I'm just like, you know, uh, we're going to have a million people uh, probably shortly in this country alone that have died uh, from, from COVID. Like we, we've not had any other disaster like this in our lifetimes. Um, so it's not customary. It's not business as usual. The rules of engagement have to be a little bit different. Um, and we have to respect the fact that the vaccines are the way we protect uh, people's lives and our livelihoods. So uh, we're going to have to make those tough decisions uh, to uh, go ahead and summon up the political will, as I think President Biden did, um, to ask everybody to step up and help get this done. Um, I don't know, that was, a, that was a tough question and no easy answer to it, um, but. Well, thanks so much, that was a great response. I, I think I, I, may, I need to make a tough call, but it's not really a big tough call, but to turn it over to Meredith now and the questions that uh, various folks in the audience are sending into the chat. Is that right, Meredith? Yeah, it is right, although I will say I am, very much enjoying this conversation. And if I didn't have all these questions in front of me, I would say, keep at it. I could listen to you all talk for the next 30 minutes, but you know, folks, folks joined and sent in some really great questions. So I wanna make sure we get to some of those. And if we have any time left, I'll turn it maybe back over to you and Grant for any final questions. Um, but first of all, uh, Dr. Ferrer, as Matt mentioned, you know, on Zoom, we don't get to share with you sort of all the excitement about the people who are uh, on the webinar. And we have all these congratulations coming into the Q&A. So I just want to start with that and let you know that people, one, are congratulating you, but are also really thrilled to have this opportunity to hear directly from you. So thank you again for being here. Thank you. And and I'm going to briefly take, um, this is what happens when they allow me to be an MC. I'm going to take a little bit of a prerogative here for just a minute and share with you that um, I have some colleagues who work in higher ed uh, in Los Angeles, and a few of them have said that they have truly appreciated working with you and your team, and they think you all have done a great job and appreciate your leadership, and they worry you don't hear about that enough, especially during the pandemic, so they asked that I relay that, and I said I would be happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Um, and so my question kind of piggybacks off of, uh, you know, sort of keeping in high, higher ed, which is I'm not sure, you know, how closely you worked with higher education institutions pre-pandemic, as you certainly did during the pandemic. And I'm curious what your experience was like working with higher education institutions to navigate this crisis. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. And, and you know, appreciate everyone's kindness. Um, obviously we've always worked with institutes of higher education around communicable disease control because we've had lots of other outbreaks. Um, so we, we've had really strong relationships and we've also worked with many institutes of higher education around workforce development. Um, so I, I do want to note that, you know, we've had a long history here of having strong relationships, and I'm really grateful uh, to our IHE partners uh, for all that they've been bringing uh, to, the, to the work in L.A. County uh, about supporting uh, people in our communities pre-pandemic and, of course, during the pandemic. I also want to applaud, um, you know, the UC system as a whole uh, and almost all of our universities here uh, in LA County uh, for again, being courageous and uh, requiring students to be vaccinated this fall because uh, it obviously made a huge difference. Um, we have very few cases uh, and even fewer outbreaks. Um, so we've got robust testing going on, um, but uh, it's just, uh, it's been a game changer 
Uh, and it really shows, you know, uh, what courageous leadership means um, and how you can then allow people to come together and enjoy uh, the enriched experience uh, that university and college campuses are offering. Um, but yes, I mean, so we work intimately now. Um, you know, again, uh, we, we have a, a process here. Uh, we develop and have since the beginning of the pandemic sector specific sort of uh, rules and responsibilities. Uh, and as we've developed uh, those directives, we've always, uh, we have what we call weekly telebriefings or biweekly telebriefings with those sectors where people can hear from us and then ask us questions and share their comments and concerns. And then, you know, it's not like we come to consensus because, you know, there's over a hundred universities and colleges here, but we're influenced strongly uh, by what's happening on the ground. Uh, as we tried, you know, from, you know, way back last March uh, to really craft a path forward uh, that would keep uh, everyone safe. Um, so I've appreciated, you know, uh, all of the leadership and, and also, you know, I think uh, many of our universities, uh, because they uh, also are research institutes have, have also really, I want to just acknowledge this, they've been huge partners on, on helping us understand um, both our data and other data that they're collecting so that we can be data informed as we're trying to move forward uh, making decisions in an ever-changing landscape. Right, well, in addition, I mean, at UC in particular, right, we have a whole health system. So they've been involved, right, from the beginning when it came yes. to testing, um, you know, treating patients in hospitals, and obviously to your point, sort of research and trying to stay on top of it. And I think, you know, yes, where UC alumni, uh, this is a UC event, but you know, to give some credit to UC, the system is largely back in person, obviously with an, you know, an abundance of precautions in place, but um, you see that across our 10 campuses, so. Yeah, which is great. Um, so actually while you, Grant and Matt were talking, I got a SACB alert. Uh, don't worry, don't panic. Um, but it is, uh, it said Governor Newsom warns of a winter COVID surge as California's positive test rate ticks up. So I'm curious, um, I'm sure that's not news to you, but how concerned are you sort of about that foreshadowing um, and how you think it's going to impact our communities over the holidays? Sure. I mean, we're super worried. Um, you know, uh, just take a look at Europe. I mean, Sometimes, you know, uh, we, we're not, we don't really learn from the past experience. Um, so we, we've, um, we here in California, we've never really come out unscathed. Like when, when cases rise in other places, because it's a global pandemic, uh, we're affected by that. Um, so uh, what we're seeing in, in Europe and, and uh, both in Western and Eastern Europe and in countries with much higher vaccination rates than what we have here, is alarming at this point. We do have the winter increase in cases. We do believe there's seasonality to this virus. Um, colder weather also drives more people inside. Um, and with people being inside, there's more intermingling in places where it's easier for the virus to be transmitted. Um, so yeah, we are worried. Um, we know that having higher vaccination rates uh, is gonna give us a lot of protection, particularly against serious illness and disease. and help us protect our healthcare system. I mean, last winter in LA County, I was reporting 250 deaths a day uh, just for LA County and 8,000 people were in the hospital a day. So we can't go back to that. That really, um, not only that, that loss of life is just um, impossible to bear, uh, but we pretty much uh, collapsed our healthcare system. Um, so the hope is because we do have a lot more people vaccinated, we will not go back to what we experienced last year. But are we going to see an increase? Um, I fear we will. And then the question is, uh, do we uh, come together like we have in the past and do what's right? So uh, we're going to need to keep our masks on this winter, um, certainly for the next six weeks, eight weeks, uh, while we constantly try to increase those vaccination rates uh, indoors, those masks are essential. Uh, we have, uh, we're still in, uh, in California, we're either in high transmission or we're in substantial transmission. No one's really getting down to low transmission rates yet. Uh, and when transmission's this high, uh, not only are unvaccinated people who are five to 10 times more likely to get infected than vaccinated people, 
uh, getting infected, but vaccinated people now when there's a lot of transmission are also having more post-vaccination infections. Um, so yeah, I know we want it to be over and I know everybody would like to ditch those masks, but those masks are a small inconvenience um, for keeping each other safe uh, when you still have a lot of transmission. So, uh, so I think we need to be wise. I think we need to be sensible. You know, we're encouraging people if you're not fully vaccinated or you have people in your household not fully vaccinated, you got to take extra precautions. This isn't the time to travel uh, until you're fully vaccinated. Um, you know, stay local, uh, stay outdoors as much as possible. We're in Southern California, so that's easier to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, we had rain up here the last two days. <laughs> so that's rare here. We could use more rain, but outdoors as much as possible. Keep those gatherings small uh, and get vaccinated if you're eligible. You know, uh, we just opened up vaccines for 900,000 children, five to 11. So uh, as you want to get ready for the for the winter, uh, it's a good idea to get vaccinated. Get your booster. You know, if you got Pfizer or Moderna six months ago or Johnson & Johnson's two months ago, get boosted um, so that in fact, everyone is going in as, as well protected as possible uh, into the winter. I think that's all great advice and reminders for folks as we especially head towards Thanksgiving and then the winter holidays. You know, a question that arises for me sort of as an average person who's not, um, you know, super tied into public health on a day-to-day -day basis is, you know, I know that the Biden administration has been really focused on the unvaccinated population. And I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, do you think that we'll make significant inroads in that with that population at any point that will um, ultimately mean that the pandemic truly does dwindle? Or will it will it ultimately will we ultimately move past it um, for a variety of other reasons? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think we need to stay the course, which is um, we need to make sure vaccines are easily accessible. And, you know, here in LA County, we've built out a network. We have 1300 sites open, uh, fixed sites that are open where people can go get vaccinated and about 400 mobile teams out every week, um, just taking vaccines to where people are at. We actually have community health workers helping us go door to door and we have a vaccine team that follows them. And, you know, if they're unvaccinated people and want to get vaccinated, they'll get vaccinated in their homes. Um, we stay very focused on vulnerable populations, workers, people in skilled nursing facilities, long-term care, people who are homebound, people experiencing homelessness. Um, so a vaccine is super easy for them. They should have no hardships. Uh, nobody should be asking a lot of questions. You don't need to show uh, IDs. You don't need to have you know, papers uh, with your documentation, your citizenship documentation. So we just have to make it super easy. Uh, for people to be able to get vaccinated. I still talk to people who are confused. They think they need insurance. They don't have money. They think they're going to get charged. Um, so we, we got to continue to spend time making sure people understand it's free for everyone. Uh, and, you know, we'll bring vaccines to you. <laughs> There's sites everywhere. Uh, and we're open weekends, evenings, you know, everything we can do to make this as accessible as possible to for people whose lives are super complicated. And then we have to continue to build trust. Um, and, uh, and part of that is, you know, funding organizations that already are trusted um, so that they can host vaccination clinics and they can provide people with information and answer people's questions. Um, and, uh, and that's gonna take a while. Um, you know, we've had decades of sort of an erosion in trust for good reasons uh, many times. And uh, to get people to feel confident that we're not lying to them, uh, that we're giving them accurate information, that we're being transparent with all that we know about vaccines, their safety and their efficacy. Uh, I think that's, we've got to stay on that track. We can never give up on sort of having to answer people's questions and address their concerns. Yeah, well, I appreciate your persistence there. So I've got a question from Alec and he's asking if you see the US public health profession as a whole uh, when it comes to addressing the issue of public health emergencies being intentionally intentionally exploited for politically divisive purposes? You know, it's such a good question of, you know, and, and, and certainly everyone has seen this play out, you know, is, you know, uh, partisan politics, partisan politicians trying to influence public health people to, you know, move in one direction or another. Um, and, and it's super hard, 
You know, you've seen people get fired, you've seen people quit, um, you've seen people under enormous pressure uh, because of the politicization of, of what, you know, we, many of us think of as, um, you know, sort of our, our, our uh, obligations um, to, to do the right thing based on the science and the data. But I want to be honest and say, like, the world is political and so are we all. And, uh, you know, data is not apolitical either. Um, and, you know, you could use data to tell many different stories and people have, you know, many false narratives are spread uh, by taking a slice of data and presenting it, uh, you know, uh, as fact when it's incomplete. Um, or um, taking results and uh, again, skewing them to tell, you know, a particular story that you want told. So, so I'm also of the mind to sort of be realistic enough to know that the world is political and uh, the work we do ends up being political for that reason. Um, but the, the best of politics is really about um, engaging with others uh, being able to debate and, you know, sort of uh, the information at hand, uh, being able to prevent, present uh, differing views and then coming together to uh, be able to advance, uh, in this case, uh, a path forward that allows people uh, to have their health and, and enjoy well-being. Uh, so my hope is that um, while we can't get rid of um, the politics of the times, uh, we can be honest and approach our work by acknowledging um, that uh, that those politics influence uh, the paths that people choose to take forward. They influence the policies that get uh, decided, um, but that doesn't really preclude us um, from being able to offer information uh, and give people access um, to the data that allows them to use that information uh, to make different kinds of decisions. But I think it's really hard right now. And, yeah. you know, my heart breaks uh, for people who have lost their jobs over this or been threatened over this, or, um, you know, felt like they had to compromise, uh, you know, the work that they were trying to do. But I, but I think that is the reality. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So, you know, you talked a little bit about, well, not a little bit, you talked at length sort of about what the winter might look like and precautions that folks should be taking sort of, you know, whether or not they're vaccinated. And I'm wondering, diving in a little bit, maybe looking ahead, is how concerned are you about potential new COVID variants that we might experience? I mean, I think that's one of the biggest fears. Um, and every time you see a surge, you know, you know, everyone's scrambling in the labs to figure out if it is a new variant. I mean, our last winter surge was a variant, the California variant. Uh, the summer surge was the Delta, this summer surge was the Delta variant. Um, and as long as there's a lot of spread, uh, that's our biggest threat is, this is a virus, viruses mutate. Um, and uh, oftentimes the mutations that end up being dominant are dominant because they're able to spread more easily. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that would be the worry is that, you know, we, we will, we'll, we'll see a, another variant. It will take hold. It will dominate, uh, what Delta variant, I mean, Delta variant is sort of a hundred percent of what we're seeing. So, and it's been like that for months now, but it's totally possible, uh, that we'll see some additional mutations. We're following obviously what happens across the world, uh, because, uh, these variants travel. Uh, they take hold and then they travel. Uh, and it's likely if there's a variant that dominates in another part of the country and is more infectious, uh, we're gonna probably experiencing, experience that here. That's why we try to explain how important it is to get vaccinated and to slow spread. Um, because if you have less and less opportunity for there to be spread, then there's less and less opportunity for the virus to mutate. So I know that Matt and Grant have got, gone off camera and uh, sorry, Dr. Ferrer, we're not really giving you a break here at all in this uh, 90, 90 minutes that you've graciously given us. Um, but this next question was partly directed at Grant. So I'm gonna open it up to all of you for any input you have. But to start, this question comes from Lisa who lives in Los Angeles. And first she starts out by saying, thank you for your ongoing leadership and graciousness 
We live in LA and your well-informed, succinct news conferences were one of our most valuable sources of information with regard to COVID-19. So for the, <laughs> I know it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> so for the group, um, I think partially for Grant though, regarding the community health program, can you please address how nutrition might fit into this? It seems unfathomable that health plans still do not cover this crucial area. It is a root of so much um, of the current disease in the world. Uh, I guess I'll start there. Uh, I agree. And I, I think, uh, it's an embarrassment that we don't do better at that. I think people often, uh, often trivialize nutrition as something that's easy to address. And I think it's actually complex scientifically and it has huge uh, political and social dimensions. Uh, the availability of healthy food uh, to people in poor communities that may live in food deserts, for example. And um, as we're developing the Global and Community Health Program, I have been speaking to local physicians with a background in this field in the hopes that we'll develop classes that directly address that. And I, I can add a, a couple of uh, yeah, please. comments on top that that, that uh, wonderful logo that uh, Grant has on his shoulder in this uh, Zoom call is a logo that was designed by one of our students, Cora Fortune. So shout out for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was designing it. We wanted her to include not just um, symbols of, of global connection, but obviously of community and um, and of our local community too. So it was trying to sort of um, figure the Santa Cruz mountains and, and fields of the, of the UCSC farm in, in there. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, agroecology and um, all the work that's done at the farm uh, remains a really strong uh, element uh, of UCSC's programming overall. It's something we can be really proud about. And uh, if um, if you look at the the, um, the well, how we are conceptualizing the different research areas in global and community health at the university, if you go to our website, uh, one of the areas that we've highlighted is agroecology and the work that they do there, uh, which is not just about um, uh, you know organic agriculture, but also about the the systems that are of, of production, the way workers are treated in the farm fields and so forth, a, a bro much broader concern with sustainability and resilience. All of those things are very much part of uh, making sure that uh, good nutrition is, is part of the future for global and community health. I think the other thing to mention is, uh, oh, another, another um, uh, research area is, is um, community gardens. And that we have links to uh, Life Lab um, and Food Watt to uh, community-based organizations that use the farm uh, to do nutritional work with youth and, and school kids. Um, and, and we have an entry on community gardens on our research page. Um, but linking it back to the um, curriculum for the new BA and, and the BS, it would be wonderful if we had a, a course on nutrition, so the, the question's a good one. Um, the, the, but the, I would perhaps, this is a, to pass the baton back to Dr. Ferrer. I think one of the lessons of um, community studies work on social justice and on um, this, the broader social and economic determinants of health is that sometimes when we talk about nutrition, we sort of take our, you know, we tell people, oh, you've got to eat, you know, two carrots a day and, you know, whatever it is, you know, in, cut down on the, on the calories and, and so forth. And we individualize uh, the responsibility uh, in a way that totally obscures the fact that large numbers of people are living in food deserts and can't get fresh food very easily and so forth. And I think that lesson from community studies remains really important for any work that we do educationally around nutrition. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, you know, we, we often talk a lot in public health that, you know, telling people to eat healthy and exercise um, 
is is really you know almost inappropriate um, if they're living in communities where there's just not good access to affordable healthy foods uh, and there's not safe places where people can um, you know take opportunities to be outside to be physically active um, so you know the conditions in which people live really determine whether or not um, they might be able to, you know, engage in healthy behaviors. I don't think like the healthy behavior side of it, whether it's nutrition, you know, eating well, or that, that sort of the healthy behavior side of the equation um, is diminished um, if we aren't really looking at uh, the conditions that are, that are available to us as we try to make our choices. Um, you know, if you, you know, live in a community with a with a farmer's market right down the street, um, and you've got full service grocery stores and walking distance, good transportation hub. Um, you've got access to refrigeration. You know, it's it's a lot easier to talk to that person about you know what they might want to do to improve their nutritional intake uh, than it is to talk to so many people who live in communities where there's really very little access. There's no full service of supermarkets. There's a lot of sort of, you know, junk food markets. There's corner stores that, you know, are paid by um, the beverage companies to, you know, put up, put up posters of unhealthy drinks and to position those unhealthy drinks at an eye-catching uh, place in the freezers or the refrigerator. So, you know, we just, we have to work within all of that. I mean, people really, um, you know, uh, rightfully, you know, they do have a lot of control uh, over some things that they're doing, but they also need to live in neighborhoods that are promoting, you know, good health and have those kinds of resources. You know, I often used to say to folks and, you know, it, it's uh, so I, around nutrition, you know, I'm, I, I'm really big also on sort of advertising and, you know, sort of what that does to all of us. And, you know, if you live in communities that uh, where people live that don't have a lot of economic means, drive down the main drag in that community and see what's being advertised everywhere. Storefronts, like just see the amount of advertisement for, you know, basically unhealthy products, alcohol, tobacco, still uh, cannabis, you know, not, no, no judgments there, but just, you know, it's, it's fast foods, sugary drinks. Um, there's just tons and tons of advertisement, alcohol, um, and, and, uh, and there's easy access um, to things that actually, you know, it, it's not like in and of themselves, they're, they're completely dangerous, but in an abundance where they crowd out everything else, um, they're problematic. Um, and, you know, and you just find that in some neighborhoods, like that's what you see, um, as opposed to uh, investments in, you know, full service grocery stores, good transportation, you know, farmers markets that really bring in, you know, healthy fresh fruits and vegetables. And, and then, you know, I'd expand, you know, our, our food programs, you know, because lots of people don't have enough money. Um, so cow fresh and, you know, the ability, nobody should not be able to have healthy foods because they can't afford them. Um, and you know, that, that, again, those are things I think, um, we need to talk about as well, but I do think nutrition is important. Uh, and, but I also think sort of in that context of what does production look like? How is production subsidized? Who's subsidizing it? Uh, what's getting subsidized, you know, who's getting, a, you know, more help than others. Uh, and what does that mean then for, for people who don't have a lot of money? Um, so and not just in this country, but across the world, because I, I think this is a real big, really big global problem. Well, thanks to Matt and Grant for coming back on camera. And I think you could probably hang out with us for the, the remaining moments here. So I think we'll squeeze in maybe one or two final questions before we make sure we wrap up promptly in time. So maybe this will be a quick one and then I wanna close out bringing it home uh, back to UC Santa Cruz. So I think Steven is the one who asked this question, recognizing that the County Board of Supervisors is led by uh, all women 
And he's curious what it's like working with such a dynamic and powerful group of women uh, helping run LA County. Yeah, I mean, I've been blessed and, and you know, I, I wanna note, um, you know, I, I've worked for, for men and for women and, um, you know, it's great having uh, an all female board. I think it, it says a lot about uh, where we where we are now, um, you know, in in LA County in terms of, you know, inspiring courageous leadership coming from women. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that there are great leaders uh, who are men as well, and there are trans people as well. Like I mean, leadership, um, you know, it, it's um, it's a complex um, set of tasks and uh, responsibilities. Uh, and the, you know, I just feel blessed that the board I'm working for is a progressive board uh, that cares deeply about uh, every single person uh, here in the county, uh, and is, you know, is really uh, firmly committed uh, to a justice agenda. Because at the end of the day, you know, that's a board you want to work for. <laughs> you know. I do think it's like, important to acknowledge uh, to though, you know, extraordinary women who. Um, haven't always been in positions like this, um, right? And it's important for other women to be able to see, to see that that is possible and, and you're one of them. So um, so let's go. I think this is a perfect final question here, uh, bringing it back to UC Santa Cruz for maybe the last minute or two is, you know, we have many students who are committed to promoting the health of their communities. What advice would you give them as they consider their future career paths and post-college plans? Yeah, you know, I think I think you, you know, I think purpose and passion go hand in hand. So you know, I always urge people to, you know, uh, make sure you're clear about your purpose, and make sure that uh, when you do your work, you feel passionate about your work. You know, probably about your life, but certainly about your work. Um, and um, you know, part of purpose, I think, uh, for many of us, you know, particularly for people, I think, at UC Santa Cruz, is being of, of service to others um, uh, and uh, being in service to others, being part of a community that comes together uh, to make this world a better place. You know, I think it's pretty straightforward um, that that's uh, what drives so many of us. And therefore, like, the world is pretty open as to what you can do um, to further that agenda, as long as you're open to acknowledging you have to do it with other people. You know, you, you can't really do this by yourself. Um, so if you wanna, if you want things to be better where you live um, or where you work, um, you, that's only gonna happen, I think. I think it's only possible if you're coming together with other people. And to do that, you gotta be listening, you gotta be respectful, uh, you gotta be attentive and you gotta go with grace. Well, we will end on that uh, perfectly sage advice. And I wanna give a special thanks to both Matt and Grant for facilitating a fantastic conversation. Um, that was, that was really, uh, really enjoyable. I could, like I said, I could have just stayed on and listened to the three of you, uh, chat. And then of course, special thanks to our alumni achievement recipient, Dr. Ferrer for your critical work and for representing UC Santa Cruz so well out in the community, um, and across California. Um, and then I want to give a special thanks to the many folks who joined us this evening, uh, for the fascinating and important conversation and for submitting such great questions for our recipient and helping us celebrate Dr. Ferrer. So with that, fiat slug, and we'll see you all at the next event. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Bye. Thank you so much.